people feel kind of shortchanged in in the choices that society is giving them. And you know, imagine you know the person that works in a career that they hate for 40 years, and they live for the weekend or they live for the two weeks off in the summer. And you know, to me, what a waste of a lifetime. You know, so to me, the freedom and the diversity that's offered in, in family farming, it, it's the best lifestyle. There isn't that much money in it, but money is, is pretty transitory. And in the end, you know, I, I think you want to feel like you, you've done something good in your life and something that you can, you know, uh, be satisfied for and, and proud of having done. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Jim Gerritsen to the podcast. Many of you may know Jim and his family for running Wood Prairie Family Farm in Bridgewater, Maine since 1976. One of the things they are best known for is certified organic seed potatoes grown and shipped direct from their family farm in Maine. So folks, if you are looking to source seed potatoes direct from the people who grew them, you could do a lot worse than getting them from Wood Prairie Farm. In fact, we've gotten seed potatoes from you in the past and they always did really well for us. People from outside of Maine may not know this, but Maine is actually a big potato producing state with a history of potato production going back to the 1700s. The way I think of it, Maine was like Idaho to the country before people started growing potatoes in Idaho, people pretty quickly realized that the short season and acidic soils and perhaps other factors you want to tell us about, Jim, made the northernmost county in Maine, Aroostook County, a really good potato producing area. But if people are familiar with coastal Maine, this is really different. Aroostook County is the largest county east of the Mississippi, and even though it's at least half a zone colder than where my farm is in central Maine, the combination of soils and season make it really good for growing potatoes. So it makes sense that you would be growing seed potatoes there. Now, Jim, you've been running your farm up there since 1976, which I will note is the year before I was born. And I really think of you guys as organic pioneers and stalwarts defending the organic standards for which I have a lot of respect. I've been lucky enough to meet you a couple of times over the years at conferences and such since we're both up here in Maine. So I know a little bit of the story, but can you tell us how you ended up farming in northern Maine close to the Canadian border? Well, um, I guess uh, I guess it starts that I went out to uh, uh, started going to college at Humboldt State uh, in northern California in Arcata and uh, as a forestry major. And in my first semester, uh, was pretty disappointed, came to put two and two together and realized that I was going to be, if I went through and got a degree, I would be uh, qualified to either work as a forester working for a multinational paper company or the U.S. government, and neither appealed to me. So at the same time, I started to work on local farms in the area and pretty quick decided that that's what I liked. And like any young person working on a farm with ambition, you don't want to end up working for another farmer. You, you develop dreams of having your own farm. So um, I ended up dropping out of college, uh, working to save money. And then when I was 21 years old, I moved <clears throat> from the West Coast uh, to Maine, didn't know anybody at all. But in the time that I was working, I had checked out every book from the Humboldt State College Library on the state of Maine and knew that I wanted to come to Aroostook County. Um, there had been, you know, at peak, almost a quarter million acre uh, of potatoes. And by the mid 70s, it was down to about 150,000 acres. So I knew that there was about 100,000 acres of cultivated land that had gone out of production. And I thought, Naively as a 21 year old here, I can get, you know, a farm at, uh, you know, a, a good deal. And so I moved out, uh, and, uh, in 76, the farm, Wood Prairie family farm that we're on to this day was the very first piece of land that I looked at. And, um, I had disciplined myself and said, I'm not going to jump at the first piece. I hate to shop. And that would be a natural tendency. But I said, I'm, I'm going to look for land for at least a month or six weeks. And uh, 
I found that every piece of land I looked at, I was comparing back to this first piece of land. So in the end, uh, I bought it 40 acres, eventually uh, up to 80 acres, and then we bought some land across the road uh, and a couple of times. So now we're up to about 130 acres or so, but in Maine, about half of the land is in forest and woodlot and half is in field. So we're farming about 60 acres. The rest is in woodlot. And uh, the land back in the mid 70s, uh, $150 an acre uh, for, I, I would say for very good soil, not the best. It's not deep like a caribou loam. It's a Mapleton Shaley silt loam that is in the same class uh, as caribou, but uh, soil is not quite as deep. You know, it's a good potato soil uh, and we're isolated. Um, I think that's one of the things that appealed to me. We're surrounded by the North Main woods on three sides, uh, right uh, butted up against it. So there is no potato production, uh, essentially no potato production going on to the uh, west, southwest or northwest of us. And that's where the primary uh, winds come from. So that isolation gives us protection from insects, disease, and, you know, isolation is a seed grower's best friend. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I know that Arista County is a big conventional potato growing region. Did you in the beginning and do you now experience skepticism around your organic methods? Well, uh, I started in 48 years ago. So, you know, as a context in time, I've always been organic. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And 48 years ago, nobody had heard of organic. Um, so, uh, uh -huh. you know, what you haven't heard of, you can't develop much uh, resistance against. Um, you know, so I, I, I think I think people can misunderstand organic and, and farmers you know, that have been under the guidance of, you know, chemical industry salesmen for, you know, three generations now might think that we're adversarial um, and might think that we don't respect the system that they're in. But, you know, somebody wise and or a wise organic farmer once said that organic farming is 80 percent good farming and 20 percent kind of the idiosyncrasies with organic. And that's how I look at it. And I would say that the people that know me, we get along well. Um, and I think that once organic started to make money 20 to 30 years ago, I think that, you know, the reality in our capitalist system, once money was being made, I think respect uh, rose that it, it was not just some kind of a, a fad or a impossible thing. And, you know, there, there are some large scale, uh, potato production going on, especially in the West where you don't have as much rain and, and, uh, fungal pressure as you've got in the East. But even here in the East, we've got operations that are on the hundreds of acres organically. So, um, you know, that's a significant scale, but in the same time, you know, 40, 50 years ago, the average, uh, farm in Maine was growing under a hundred acres of potatoes and now it's up to 700 acres. So everything has consolidated. Everything has gotten uh, larger uh, f uh, to, to give numbers to it. Uh, that 150,000 acres that we had back in the mid seventies, it's now down to 50,000 acres, but we had 12 to 1500 farmers back then growing that acreage and we're now down to less than a hundred. Uh, so the liquidation of family farmers has gone out at a much greater rate than the liquidation of potato acreage. Uh, so now the farms are large, uh, capital intensive. They're, they're pretty big farms. It's not just in Maine, but, you know, every state that grows potatoes now, it's, uh, you know, a, a potato harvester is a half million dollar investment. Uh, you know, it's a capital intensive, uh, potato storage is multi-million dollars to keep the, the crop in good condition through the winter. So it's uh, it's it's not an easy crop to approach as a small farmer, but we've benefited from being in, you know, through the early 1950s, Maine was known as the, the Maine Potato Empire, and Maine was the number one potato producing state in the nation. You know, Idaho was getting its start back in the 30s. 
and uh, they can get a higher production per acre. And so the shift, the uh, production is shifted west. Uh, they're getting a better yield out there. They've got a longer growing season. They've got uh, uh, federally subsidized irrigation. Um, and when you have a long growing season and can pump water onto potatoes, you can get quite a yield per acre. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I guess that's a, that's a trend that we're seeing it through agriculture and not just in potatoes as far as the um, – the, it seems like the big are getting bigger, which is there's a lot of consolidation in farming right now. And um, of course, that's not the the growing for market listenership for the most part. You know, we are we're we're I guess I call it direct market farming is, is mostly the people who who listen to uh, this podcast or get the magazine. We think they're doing farmers markets and CSAs and farm stands and some some local wholesaling and things like that. But at, at the bigger end of the spectrum. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, consolidation. And what I often tell people about Arista County is that my understanding is that it has a, a naturally acidic soils, has some good, good soils as far as depth and those kinds of things, and that it doesn't get too hot, right? Potatoes don't really want to be in a really hot summer. Is that Am, do I have that right? Are there other things? Are there other reasons why Maine what became such a big potato growing state early yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. It, it used to not get that hot. I mean, like like everywhere in the last twenty years, we're getting a lot more heat than we've ever had. Um, the falls are staying warmer longer. The springs are tending to stay colder longer, so winter won't let go. Um, but generally, in the summer. Um, uh, you know, the, the recent pattern of the last two years is the aberration. We've gone back into wet conditions the last two years. But for the five years prior to that, it was hot and dry. Uh, and <laughs> giving us firsthand experience, it is easier to grow when it's hot and dry than when it's wet and cold, uh, grow potatoes. Um, so um, the reason a rustic um, benefited deep caribou loam Ag soils are divided in, into classes. So class one is the very best soil. Class six is, is a gravel pit. So uh, the caribou loam, uh, the prominent uh, soil in all of Aroostook County, is a class two soil. And th they, they downgrade each class based on limitations. And the limitation, which I don't think is fair, but the limitation that... Um, prejudices against Aroostook County is because we have a short growing season. Well, that's not our fault, but it if, if this class two land was down in Southern Maine or, you know, Massachusetts, it would be class one land, but it's class two because of a short growing season. So it, my understanding is that the uh, uh, Aroostook County potato soils is the largest expanse of high quality ag soils in all of New England. Um, mm -hmm. And and it would cool the, the important market advantage that Maine always had was it would cool down quickly in the fall. Like harvest time would begin in September and, you know, wind down by the first or second week of October. And very quickly, once October rolled around, it would get cool at night. And it was, um, it allowed us to cool down our underground storages, uh, by opening the doors at night and bringing in cold air and, that was the advantage that allowed Maine to uh, get high quality storage conditions, cool the potatoes down quick so that they're going to keep through the winter. And you contrast that with an area like Pennsylvania, good growing land, but it doesn't cool down enough in the fall so that they need to market those potatoes the first half of winter because they won't keep as long as they do up here. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, that you mentioned Pennsylvania because we, my family is from Pennsylvania, part of it at least, and that's where we actually originally started our farm. It didn't end up working out in Pennsylvania, so we, we moved our farm up here to Maine about 15 years ago. And uh, so, I, yeah, I definitely know what you mean about how, um, you know, it cools right down in the fall uh, usually, and I can see how that would be a huge asset, especially before people had the electricity and the refrigeration systems and things like that to to artificially cool down um, those areas because I, for people who haven't been, it's a pretty common sight up in Arista County to see the potato houses, almost like these big barns. A lot of them are dug into the side of a hill or something like that, that um, designed to, to store just tons and tons of potatoes. And uh, do they still let uh, 
is there still a break in the fall up there? I know there used to be a fall break so that uh, they would get, give kids off of school in the fall so they could help their families get the potatoes in. Is that still up there? Or? Yeah, it, it it still continues, but it varies by school district. So uh, we're in the Mars Hill School District, and um, they'll be one of the last districts to abandon potato harvest. The, the problem is you've got a three-week long harvest season, so it's not really long enough to attract outside labor to come in, farm labor to come in. Uh, so it varies yeah. by school district in Presque Isle, uh, one of the, I guess, the largest town up here. They uh, actually voted to abandon their um, harvest break about four or five years ago before COVID. And then there was such an outcry <laughs> that they reversed their decision within a year. So they're continuing to do it. Uh, we do it in this town, but... Uh, there aren't that many uh, school districts left that are doing it. But uh, this began after World War II um, when uh, the state of Maine came up with uh, – it, it used to be up and through World War II, school wouldn't start up until early November after the farming season got done, and then it would continue through the winter until mud season in March. And then the legislature in the late 1940s decided that we needed to have a standard 175-day school year, and this threw into um, kind of chaos Arusta County, which relied upon, you know, kids and families to harvest the crop by hand. So they actually had to pass a state law. At that point, Arusta County had twice the population we have now, and, and they had some sway in Augusta. And they passed a law allowing them to start up classes in August, take off the three weeks for harvest break, and that has continued nonstop since the since world the end of World War II. Okay, interesting. Well, it really is a beautiful area up there where you guys are. I, I don't know if you know this, but I uh, in another life I used to work for Johnny Selected Seeds, and so um, I would actually come up to Arista County during the years that I was doing that because we were working with some big potato growers up there who are just trying to diversify their cropping a little bit. And so it's such a different climate than most of the rest of the country that we would actually plant trials of like brassicas and things like that um, to, uh, because none of the brassica varieties are bred for a Northern Maine kind of climate. In fact, most of them are bred for coastal California where most of the industrial production is. And so we were basically running these trials up in Aroostook County to try to figure out which varieties that were already on the market uh, would work up there. And it was always, it was always fun to yeah drive up through Mars Hill and, um, and, uh, but it was, it was interesting. Um, it was just such a, it's just such a different world than down here where I, um, where, where where we live. In fact, I think that was the first time that I'd seen a robotic driven tractor or robotic assist because I was on this big uh, potato farm d putting in a broccoli trial. And in the, the adjacent field, uh, there was somebody, I think they were planting potatoes and no, no, actually they were, pl they were planting broccoli. And so they had, they, they had a tractor that was, you know, everything was like laser, laser lined out. And so I was, I was there like with my earthway planting this little, little broccoli trial. And I, I look over at this field with this big tractor pulling, you know, seeding many rows at a time of broccoli. And I see the guy hop out of the tractor while it's running, go around to the back, look at all of the seeders, make sure they're still dropping seed and then hop back in to make the turn at the end of the row. It was just, uh, it's just a different world, um, uh, than when, where we come from. And, um, uh, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but it's it's it, it's interesting. I was thinking about your your story about having gone to to uh, to school for forestry and realizing that it's not really what what you had in mind. Because my wife and partner in farming, and um, she actually, she was very interested in geology, and so she went to school for geology only to realize that the she was being prepared to to find you know oil deposits or basically figure out like oil drilling or how to blast a hillside for mining. And so it, it, it really, it kind of reminds me of her journey in a way, because that led her to where we are with farming. And it has actually come in handy because she has a really good understanding of, you know, how soils are generated from the bedrock components and things like that. And she, she likes to talk about how the, the, the rocks or the, the earth's bones that under, underlays all the soil that we, that we work with. But, um, 
that's just in, interesting to me that you guys in a way had a similar uh realization in in your uh the, your college chosen profession that it wasn't really what what uh you had in mind yeah i, I think the trend towards specialization uh it's coming up short you know uh what we all want you know we we want to contribute um to making our community strong and you know to to try to figure out how to interact with the earth in a harmonious manner leaving the soil in a better condition than when we arrived and when you get into these specialties you're just you put blinders on and you're only looking at it one way and i think part of the appeal of family farming is that you you've got to be a jack of all trades and and that necessarily means you're not going to be that good at any one thing but you know to be able to put it together i think it's uh, uh it's a very challenging opportunity to try to make it you know make it financially make it from a, a green thumb kind of production standpoint a marketing standpoint putting it all together and the reward it, it's certainly not finary uh financial um but it, you know you feel like you know, this is what I want to be doing. And I think that's, I, I think that's what is driving the interest of coming into family farming and small farming is people feel kind of shortchanged in, in the choices that society is giving them. And, you know, imagine, you know, the person that works in a career that they hate for 40 years and they live for the weekend or they live for the two weeks off in the summer. And, you know, to me, what a waste of a lifetime, you know. So to me, the freedom and the diversity that's offered in, in family farming, it, it's the best lifestyle. There isn't that much money in it, but money is, is pretty transitory. And in the end, you know, I, I think you want to feel like you, you've done something good in your life and something that you can, you know, uh, be satisfied for and, and proud of having done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I yeah, a lot of organic farmers wear a lot of different hats, but it can be a very satisfying lifestyle, and that's why actually on, you know, here at, at the magazine and the podcast, we're, we're trying to do a lot with business resources for farmers, just because I think yeah, nobody gets into it for the business, but um, I feel like there are more resources out there now, more good resources that can help f farmers figure out how to just how to how to think about their numbers and be profitable and all those kinds of things of course yeah i don't think m most anybody gets into farming uh for the numbers but it's one of those things where if they don't understand how to understand their business you know they're not going to stay in in farming for long so we're consciously trying to focus on the business aspect just to help people stay in business if the, if that makes any sense like as you know growing for market is um going to be 34 years old in um in 2024 and i feel like it's there's been a bit of a progression i know from talking with lynn bazinski who of course founded growing for market who i took it over from i feel like the the, the first sort of like wave of growing for market articles were just how to grow stuff you know let's see it was founded in 1992 and i feel like that was really kind of a low water point for market farming um a, a lot of the traditions uh had been lost from people who knew how to do family farming as as family as farms got industrialized and so i feel like one of the first waves was just how to grow stuff and then i feel like there was then there became more of a focus on how, well how then how do you sell it it's like okay so you've grown this stuff how do you sell it and i feel like one of the focuses we're trying to bring in is is also just how to be a good business person while still staying a, a, sm a small farm a family farm but how to be a good business person and keep your business afloat inside of that. You've got your thumb on the pulse. Um, starting out, we had to figure out how to grow. You know, the question was the production. How do you grow organic? And, you know, we had a uh, we became part of a group across the line in Canada. Uh, its acronym was SAVE, uh, Sustainable Agriculture for the Valley Ecosystem, St. John Valley. And we'd have meetings once a month and farmers that were interested in sustainable farming, organic farming, you know, we'd get together and we'd talk about what we were doing and what challenges we had. And, and you know, it was it was a production based um, need because that we were trying to figure out how to do it. 
once we figured out how to do it, it quickly became uh, obvious that we needed to focus on the business side, develop a market. You know, there wasn't a market for organic produce back then. Um, so develop a market uh -huh. and then, you know, uh, learn along the way business practices so that we could, you know, make a living. We, we, we eventually learned that we can produce this now. The challenge is how can we sell it at a good enough price that we can make a living out of it? Makes sense. Well, c can you tell us a bit more about your farm family, just to give listeners an idea of what your farm is like? I think you have adult children who are part of the farm. Um, I know I, I've seen you, you guys seem to always have projects going on because I've, I've seen your stuff on uh, on Instagram and you, you you seem to always be uh, working on something. But I'm wondering, uh, maybe you even uh, employ more people in the winter for sh sorting and shipping potatoes than you do in the summer. Can you just tell us a bit about how what the, the year looks like there on Wood Prairie? Despite our best efforts, we always seem to be completely different than everybody else. So we need more help in the wintertime. Uh, marketing and moving out our crop than we do in the summertime. Um, potatoes is uh -huh. a crop uh, that lends itself towards mechanization and the mechanization on the, you know, on the conventional side has really reached an industrial scale. Um, we, we bought a new potato harvester this summer, a new used one, 25 year old, but you know, new to us. And the farmer that we bought it from, he retired a couple of years ago, and I've he's been a seed grower that I've known for 25 years. And he had sold, he has some nice uh, river bottom land along the Aroostook River in the town of Washburn. Um, and, uh, and he was saying that the uh, farmer that bought his f uh, farm this spring, they were, they had grown potatoes last year. So this year they were planting uh, oats on the field and for looking out from his uh, picture window, he added up $2 million worth of equipment on that field, planting that very low value crop of oats. And it, it just, it's, uh, it's crazy how expensive that kind of farming has become and how tenuous. And, you know, you don't make money on grain, you try to make money on potatoes. And then in the bad years, you try not to lose too much money on potatoes because you could go out in one year by losing too big. So you try to keep the brakes on, uh, minimize your losses five out of six years, the sixth year that you make money, make enough money to replace some of your equipment until the next profitable year, five or seven years down the line. It, it really, it, it really seems like a, a, a form of insanity, but that's American agriculture. Um, and potatoes, it's volatile because it's a semi perishable crop. You know, the crop that you harvest in the fall, that's got to be marketed within 12 months. If you're growing wheat, corn, soybeans, that you could theoretically store, you know, the kamut that, you know, Bob uh, got going in uh, Montana, that those kernels were, what, 2,000 years old? So you've got a perishable versus or a semi-perishable versus a non-perishable. So a year like this one, for example, there was good weather in almost all of the uh, western half of North America. Uh, it was wet here in the east from Ontario east, and uh, that was the only area where the production was down because of too much water. But out west, you know, I, I think in Alberta, uh, they abandoned either Alberta or Manitoba. They abandoned five or 7,000 acres, didn't bother to dig them because they didn't think there'd be a market for them. And these are processed growers that are growing for french fry factories but uh anyway in you know we've, we've been in short supply since covid began and then it flip-flopped and finally uh crop of 2023 uh you know there is a big probably a five percent oversupply uh and, and that's going to take its toll uh um anyway the the point is uh potatoes are a different kind of a crop because uh they're a semi-perishable you know, lettuce, you've got a week or 10 days to, you know, harvest it and sell it and get it into a home. Potatoes, you've got 12 months, really practically speaking, nine months. But uh, with grains, you've got, you know, a lot more longevity and you can buffer out between one year to, to the next. If you have a, a good corn year one year, you could hold that corn supply back. Uh, to wait for the price to come up, say, if the following year is a rainy year and the production is down. 
Uh, so every right. uh, every crop has its own idiosyncrasies. Um, and here, you know, pretty much cool nights, good deep soil, uh, doesn't get too hot. And, you know, um, being at national organic meetings, I quickly learned to keep my mouth shut when, it, you know, in Maine, we talk about going three weeks and call that a drought. And I, you know, my uh, my uncle in South Dakota has a cattle ranch uh, that's been in the family for generations, and they could go for two years without rain. So I, I learned to keep my mouth shut when it came to drought. You know, in Maine, we were not qualified to talk about drought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. We, we are spoiled. Um Usually in a good way, a little, a little too much rain this year for me. But yeah, when we were, when uh, my wife and I, we were apprenticing, we, we apprenticed on a, a organic farm outside of Chico, California. And I, re I remember that the farmer telling us irrigation is like a religion here, right? Because they, they didn't get any rain during the growing season. If the pump broke down or anything, they are immediately starting to go behind. And so actually that's one thing. Uh, I think that we benefited from of working on farms in different parts of the country because we saw how different it is. And yeah, and honestly, besides the fact that all the, the farmland was really expensive out there in California, we also thought like, maybe we want to go back east where it just rains and we don't have to be completely dependent on the infrastructure and water rights and all these things to get our crops to grow. And so, you know, we ended up back here uh, anyway. Oh, 48 years ago, that was one of the considerations that I had. It just seemed like in the West where you had, you, it, it developed a level of complication and necessity of having to interact with uh, regulators. And it seemed a lot more sensible to me to go to an area that had good soil and that got natural rainfall. And I've since modified that. And I think in a short growing season area like Maine, you really do have to have irrigation as a backup that if you go more than 10 days with uh, water stress on a crop like potatoes, you're going to take a hit on yield. So I, you know, um, you, you start out when you're 21 years old with a certain view and then as experience goes along, you see, but I think generally that's right. Uh, you, you know, we're better off in Maine and the pendulum swings those guys out west that are reliant upon irrigation, if you don't get, um, e if you either don't get the precipitation in the winter, um, or if you get it and it comes as rain and it doesn't get stored in a snowpack, uh, you may not have water to grow a crop. And in Maine, you know, yeah. it, it can, the pendulum can swing between way too wet and way too dry. But compared to out west, it, it you know, uh, I've, I've talked with farmers that firmly believe that Arusa County's potato acreage is destined to increase as they uh, run into production difficulties out west because of the lack of water. Well, that's that's interesting because I can say um, even just the 15 years that we've been here in Maine, it, it seems like weather events are definitely getting more extreme as far as uh, – either prolonged periods of rain or or prolonged periods of, of drought. Was your crop harmed by too much rain this year? We had uh, 28 inches of rain during the growing season, and uh, it takes 14 inches to grow a crop of potatoes. So basically, we got enough rain to grow two crops of potatoes. So we um, we did get drown out. Uh, the uh, fields that we farmed this year were on the home farm. And in a, in a normal year, whatever that now means, uh, we probably would get a 15% better yield on the home farm because it's got low spots in the field that hold water better. So when it turns dry in July and August, we the plants would remain in better conditions, the tubers would size. On the flip side, uh, in a wet year, that wet ground, you know, we probably had 15% of our acreage uh, drown out. So that hit on yield. And, and then I think... Uh, that we had so much rain that the rain came from cloudy days and the cloudy days cut down the amount of solar radiation coming to the crop. So uh, apparently most everybody had, you know, um, pretty good sized crops, but in a wet year, you always have more, more pickouts and more rot. And, you know, we've, we've been spoiled. I, I think it is easier to grow a crop in dry weather. 
And, you know, we, we built a couple of irrigation ponds just to give us the capacity of irrigating when it does turn dry in July and August. Uh, but, uh, for about, you no, know, after we got done building them for about 10 years, it was so wet that we never irrigated. And then, you know, the pendulum was swung and we went for about five dry years and we were glad to have had that water when we needed it. But, uh, so this year, I would say that it, it was too much rain. Uh, and, you know, uh, you, you get one roll of the dice every year. Um, you know, we started out the first three weeks in May, we didn't have a drop of rain. And I thought it reminded me of 1995, which was, um, the driest year that we'd ever experienced. And then come 2020, that was the, uh, it superseded 95 and the driest year, you know, going back a hundred years, probably one, those two years, 95 and, uh, uh, 2020 were the two driest years, probably two of the five driest years in the last hundred years. Uh, so we've been through that and being through real wet years, <laughs> being through real dry years, I'd pick real dry years, but that's because we have irrigation ponds and, and we have plans to continue to dig more ponds so that we never run out of water if we need it. But, uh, you, you know, too little water, you can irrigate too much water and you've got a problem with an underground crop yeah, like yeah. potatoes. Yeah. I was just wondering, cause it, it, it was super wet down here. It was just, it was just definitely more, uh, more rain and than ideal and not enough heat to go along with it. So I was just wondering if you had the same thing up there. Potatoes love um, water and they love it cool, but too much, any good thing is too much, you know? So this was one of those years. Yeah. Did you or do you still grow table stock or have you always been focused on seed potatoes? Well, I think most organic guys get into table stock and that's probably a good thing to, to gain your experience growing table. Um, but we saw 25 years ago, we could see, we, we saw the experience of the conventional market to where you had big production out West, like Idaho, for example, they get half again the yield that we get in Maine. And there was a year when we had, we were down to 60,000 acres. And in one year, Idaho increased their production by 40,000 acres. Since they get half again as big a crop, they increased their production like by the, the production that we get in Maine. So these guys in Maine get awfully discouraged because it's like, you know, they knew yeah. that was going to depress the price from those guys out West that go gung ho on the production and you get, you know, they, they say something like a 5% uh, oversupply of a crop is going to drop prices at least 70% to below the cost of production. And, you know, the guys here in Maine, they didn't, they're not overproducing, you know, but in, in one fell swoop, the guys out West, and that was just one state. So it, it becomes, it becomes a challenge. And I think within agriculture, there is kind of a, um, competition between the east and the west and you know uh, a lot of the guys in the east blame a lot of their problems on the guys in the west and maybe vice versa <laughs> probably so i'd like to ask you a little bit about seed potato production i know that because they are vegetatively propagated with the the seed piece uh, viruses and other diseases can build up in potatoes over time so I seem to remember that seed potato lines have to be propagated by tissue culture or something like that to keep them free of viruses every few generations. Um, is that the case with organic seed potatoes? And either way, can you tell me how you keep pathogens out of the seed potatoes? Yeah, I mean, that would that would do a whole interview on itself. And I'm not known for, you know, I'm known for being pretty long winded. The, the gist of it is it's at least as big a problem for organic as for conventional. Conventional uh, use some pretty heavy duty uh, uh, pesticides. For example, they'll use um, systemic insecticides, the Bayer product admire, for example, they'll uh, lay that in furrow next to the seed piece. It, be, it, you know, goes into the plant and it's um, systemic in that it translocates to every part of the plant. So uh, even though you put it in furrow, it basically is creating a poison for the leaf. So an aphid jumps on that leaf and eats it. And uh, up through the first week in August, um, when the uh, strength tends to run out, that aphid is going to be killed in, you know, a matter of two or three seconds. The problem is they can transfer virus 
uh, they can vector virus from a sick plant to a health, a formerly healthy plant in one second. So, um, there's kind of a, there, there's a need for a paradigm shift, but obviously organic farmers aren't using, uh, systemic insecticides. So in our case, um, well, to answer your question, yes, uh, the foundation of the seed potato industry is the use of tissue cultured stock, which is disease free. And then there's the production of mini tubers from that tissue cultured stock. And then from mini to- tubers, you multiply up. So, our way of getting around this is we uh, we get tissue cultured potato plantlets that look like kind of scrawny um, alfalfa sprouts, and then um, they they come to us in uh, petri dishes uh, or peach tree dishes, depending on where you're uh, a congressman from, uh, and and we plant them in soilless media in mushroom totes and. Um, and then those produce mini tubers. So where we produce them, we have um, inse- uh, aphid excluding netting, which we imported from France. And this prevents it. It's aphids that spread the virus. So if you can keep the aphids out, uh-huh. then you prevent the spread of virus. So we grow, the, we produce the mini tubers in one, what we call our short tunnel. And then we take the entirety of that crop. And the next year we plant it out in the soil in a, a 600 foot long um, um, tunnel that's covered with aphid excluding netting. So the harvest of that second crop is called nuclear one uh, or FY1 field year one. And then we grow that in the field and, and we multiply it up for a year or two before we have it uh, to sell as seed. Um, so we do the tissue culturing and then because we're not using these hard insecticides, we're using a physical netting to prevent aphids from getting in. And that gives us two generations of uh, protection before we multiply out in the field. Wow. So you've, so you've grown those potatoes for a couple seasons before you're even growing them to, to give to the customer. That's right. Yeah. Uh, probably on average three to four years multiplying it up. So it, it takes a while to turn the ship around. You know, it's a slow process. Yeah, yeah. But that's important, though, right? Because, you know, people may be thinking or may have saved just saved their old uh, potatoes for seed potatoes. And it's important to do that step, though, right, to keep the the, the viruses from building up. That's why if, if someone just kept saving their seed potato indefinitely, they would just they would probably end up with with a, a lot of loss uh from from viruses eventually yeah it, it gets bad that you know you plant 10 pounds of seed and then you get back a harvest of 10 pounds so you know you might as well go fishing if you're going to do that right uh so yeah you do get a build-up and and the build-up can occur very quickly within a single generation and that spread for the most part the spread is from aphids um so yeah. you know if you're in the north you can probably uh, save your seed and plant it out for a year, maybe even two years, and then you want to start over with with seed that's been checked for virus content. The further south you are, uh, the more frequent that you want to um, get certified seed. And you know, if you look at um, you know the big scale conventional potato farmers, everyone, with virtually no exception, they buy certified seed because. You've got so much risk in growing a crop like potatoes to begin with uh, that it's just one way to cut down your risk so that you don't get a yield reducing virus. And that's what, you know, virus does is it prevents the plant from, you know, um, from from being healthy and producing uh, at, at its utmost. And and the state of Maine has inspectors that come out and check our fields to make sure that our virus is within tolerance and you know, uh, and then the final step is that we take a sample of every seed lot uh, at harvest time and they do a test on that, a post harvest test. And that's a pass fail test. You know, even if you uh, had good field readings, you could get aphid spread, um, you know, in August or September when you're, you know, uh, when the plants are dying down. And if you get current season aphid spread, very often it's not. Uh, distinguishable what when we're roguing you can't see it it doesn't express uh so that's why they do the post-harvest test it's a uh if it's a accurately 
uh, taken sample, it gives you a good representation of what what's in that seed lot and how it's going to perform the next year in the virus content. So the whole concept is a good concept. And, you know, for a, a market grower, uh, some people will hold back their small potatoes and plant them and, you know, and, and you can do that, but you might want to consider that if you can get a good price for baby potatoes of the market, you know, put them in a uh, one pint strawberry crate and sell them for a good price that you might be better off just cutting your risk down. And, and if you find a, a, a seed potato operation that you've got confidence in buying it from them and, you know, the, uh, the seed potato industry is interesting uh, in that it's still relatively decentralized. You know, you've got about eight northern tier states that produce seed. And within those states, you've got anywhere from, you know, uh, five, ten in Maine, you've got probably 60, 70 growers that are growing seed. Uh, so if you can, you know, it, it comes down to the individual, like, you know, Rob Johnson at Johnny's was telling me years ago that um, uh, Lutz Greenleaf beet seed that we used to grow for our CSA in the early 90s. Uh, there are two growers of uh, Lutz Greenleaf beet seed, and they're on some island in Puget Sound. Uh, so all of the Lutz Greenleaf beet seed in the United States were grown by, you know, one of two farmers. So that, that's what I call concentrated production with potato farming nationally. I think there's 110,000 acres of uh, seed potatoes that are grown and some states do a better job than other states. Uh, so it, it's not homogeneous. You want to, you know, find good seed and then uh, get it from that farmer that's doing a good job. Okay, well, that's that's what I wanted to ask you about because I know just knew just a little bit about it from working in the seed industry a little bit, but I I'm guessing that a lot of our listeners didn't know how much actually goes into uh, seed potato production. It's it's you know it's I just wanted them to know. Well, I was curious myself. I also wanted them to know it's not just somebody just saving their seed from year to year and being like, well, I guess I'll grow seed. Uh, you know, seed potatoes for sale this year. You know, it's a very specific chain of events is, that keeps this the the seed potatoes lively and free of viruses, like you said. So, okay. and, and it also is kind of a, um, a, it's a community production. Like the state of Maine has a very good reputation for growing seed potatoes, and uh, they had uh, state of Maine. I think had the second certified seed. Uh, program put together. I think it was 1915. Wisconsin came up with theirs in 1914. Maine came up with theirs a year later in 1915. So for over a hundred years in this seed certification, you know, you, you've got a state reputation to protect and, you know, it's a community deal. Everybody's got to do a good job and, and it's pretty rigorous to meet the requirements of seed certification. For example, we have to completely empty out our potato storage. We have to uh, clean with a uh, hot water pressure washer and then disinfect with uh, Clorox bleach. And then each and every pallet box that we have, we have to clean it down. And Clorox does a good job. Uh, but if you have a, you know, um, one smidge of dirt or a little bit of potato slime that you didn't clean off, that will deactivate the uh, killing power of the Clorox. And what we're all trying to um, prevent is this uh, condition called bacterial ring rot, which um, uh, it's nasty, it's it's highly uh, spreadable. And, you know, it's something that y you got to be really careful that you don't bring it onto your farm. It, it's assumed that by the time the inspectors find it, that you probably had it on the farm for two or three years before it multiplied up to a, a, a point to where it could be discovered. And uh, and then you've got to sell off every bit of seed you have and start completely over. And and then, you know, I, it, it's something you want to uh, want to avoid. So, um, and, and, you know, the conventional guys, they're using quaternary ammonia, which is not nearly so sensitive if there's any uh, organic matter left behind. But with organic, you got to do, you know, a near perfect job to be able to protect yourself and your customers. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for doing that to keep the, keep the seed, uh, the organic seed potato, uh, you know, availability 
vibrant and in in, uh, in disease free. Um, well, you've been doing this long enough. You must have heard all the difficulties anyone can have with growing potatoes, especially with selling direct to the public. As you do, you know, I'm sure you get feedback from people on on what their their pitfalls were. Um, for the listeners, can you give them just the basics of what you would tell people about growing a good crop of potatoes, or we can just hit the highlights of what people tend to have problems with, or what the common pitfalls are that you've seen hurt people's potato production over the years? Almost like an elevator speech, maybe. I realize you could probably write a book about potato production, but I'm just thinking like if there's common things that people get wrong or quick, almost like your elevator speech for, you know, if... if uh, if you just had to pass a few things on to people about how they can be successful with, with your seed potatoes, what would you be telling people? So uh, we've been selling seed mail order, seed potato mail order for almost 35 years. So we have gotten, you know, uh, a, a fair number of people, you know, wondering why their crop didn't produce. So what we've boiled it down to is that there's three factors. And the simple one is water. Make sure that if, if nature is not giving you enough rain, you got to give give it in the form of irrigation, and potatoes will do best, like most vegetable crops, with one to one and a half inches of rain a week. And it's most important during the tuber bulking, which is occurring. You know, it's the next stage after uh, the blossoms come, and then they drop off the plants, and you've got tubers underneath, and then they're sizing. Obviously. Uh, potatoes, 80% water. If it's not getting water, if you go on vacation in August for a couple of weeks and it didn't, didn't rain, those tubers are going to be hurt by it. So water is the first thing. Then the second and third thing are freedom from insect pressure and freedom from disease pressure. And both the insects and diseases are going to vary geographically where you're located. Um, down south, they have Hotter temperatures, more insect activity. The insects come in earlier. Uh, if you've got humid conditions, uh, you've got more pressure for late blight or early blight or white mold. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe you saw this at Johnny's. I think a lot of growers starting out assume that seed is seed is seed. And, uh, you know, we've tried growing many, many different crops over the years uh, we had a CSA for uh, for four years in the early 90s. Um, and, you know, we grew 30 or 40 different uh, vegetables for that. And what our experience tells me and the reason I think it helped propel us to go into producing seed is there is really a significant difference between good seed and mediocre seed and then bad seed. And with potatoes, I, I mean, it just has been our experience. Um, there was one year we brought in, we were growing Yukon gold and we had three seed lots, one that, uh, a seed lot that we had grown the year before, another that we got from the state of Maine seed farm and another I brought in from a, a grower in, in New Brunswick, Canada. And it was all certified seed and it all looked good at planting. But, um, when we went to harvest, our seed lot looked beautiful. The seed lot that we got from, um, the uh, Porter farm here in Maine, that looked good, but that stuff from, that we brought in from Canada, it was 80% scab. And we planted in the same field on the same day. The only variable was the seed lot. So here we had a crop that was virtually not marketable because it was so heavy in seed. And then the next winter, uh, I went back to look at it and started talking to the farmer and his rotation had kind of, you know, uh, he'd gotten into a two year rotation of potatoes every other year, and it's just not long enough, uh, to, for the good of the soil. And I think he'd build up the scabies population in his soil. And when you get a combination of a dry year that scab likes, and you've got a susceptible variety like, um, Yukon gold, you can harvest it. And even I, th I think this is my belief. I, I don't know if a scientist would back me up, but I think there is, a subclinical level of scab in seed potatoes that you can't see to the human eye, but it was in that seed lot that we planted. And that's, you know, it, there was some dryness in that year. And I think that's why we got kicked in the back of the head with that seed lot. And, and it comes from not having a good rotation, not taking good enough care of your soil. And, you know, I, I like the potato grower, but we can't afford to buy from a grower that, you know, gives us a crop like that, you know, 
it just doesn't, the economics don't work. Anyway, um, so uh, you want to make sure that, you know, an insect pressure can vary and it's going to, you know, I think a lot of times in the East anyway, potato leaf hoppers are the bigger problem, but they're so small that no, they don't even know, they think it's a disease because these things are so small when they go by, but they'll suck the juice out of the plant and when they put their probe in, in their saliva, they've got enzymes which are causing a breakdown. So that uh, causes this uh, color, you know, discoloration, and, and basically it kills the uh, uh, kills the plant. So and it can take place very quickly. So I think the leaf hopper uh, hopper burn uh, can take quite a toll on on potatoes. And there isn't any great solution organically. You can use uh, Pyganic 5.0. But it's a broad spectrum. Um, and, you know, we use it as a last resort if we need to. We haven't used it in probably five years. Uh, and way back, we tried the uh, uh, colloidal clay uh, surround WP, which um, uh, you apply it. <laughs> and uh, you apply it and it goes on the leaf and it looks good. But when that leaf dries, it's got this white powder. So you've got a whole field of white powder. And I thought, boy, my neighbor's driving by. They're going to think I'm cheating here, <laughs> have applied diethane or something on <laughs> my crop. But uh, it, it did seem to work. But I think it would work really good in the West where you can irrigate with drip irrigation, keep your leaves dry. Because here in Maine, we'd be spraying every seven days. And after we'd spray, then the rain would wash it off and we'd go on put some more on and it you could tell that you know maybe 10 percent was sticking on and 90 percent was washing off but it did seem to have a benefit uh, and i would i would do it again but i think it would really be good if you're in the west where you aren't getting rainfall in the summer and you can apply drip irrigation keep the leaves dry so disease problems insect problems it really comes down to the locale that you're in and if you're isolated enough, it could be that you're not going to have any of those problems. And, you know, potatoes are a pretty quick crop to get in and out. And we advocate green sprouting, warming up the seed. It's an optional seed uh, preconditioning that you can do. And if you do a, a full job of it and uh, on our website, we've got a, a organic growing guide and you can read the details on that if you don't know about it. But you basically start the procedure a month before your intended planting date, warm the seed up in the dark at 70 to 75 degrees. Once you've broken dormancy, which will be about seven or 10 days, you reduce the temperature down to 50 to 55 degrees and turn the lights on and the lights will color up the uh, potatoes green and it will prevent elongation of the sprout. Uh, but if you go through this procedure that we lay out, uh, you know, it's an established procedure. It's done fairly commonly in Holland and in Europe, not very common here in the United States, but it'll shave um, 10 to 14 days off the growth cycle in the field. So if you're a market grower and you want to get to the market with the earliest potatoes, green sprouting will give you that ability to, you know, beat your competition that plants cold seed into cold soil. You can plant warm seed that's pre-sprouted and will quickly come up through the ground It'll be easier to uh, keep the weeds out because you've got an earlier emerging, stronger plant. And, you know, in my book, if you can find the time to do it in the spring, and that's a difficult time for market growers, but it really um, uh, pays dividends in doing it. And, you know, I, I think it's a good plan if you can find the time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That is a good method. Um, in fact, that reminds me, Jim, we will, of course, we're going to link to the Wood Prairie Farm website in the show notes. And so we'll find the link to that organic growing guide too, uh, and put a link in there so people can, can, you know, find, find your long format advice on, on growing potatoes. In fact, we, we have an article in the Growing for Market archives about green sprouting that we'll also link to so people can see that. In fact, I saw you did a video on, uh, that went out on Instagram pretty recently about um, green sprouting. So if people are, are more into the short format kind of thing, they can go go to the Wood Prairie Farm uh, Instagram and see, in fact, you, you know, the, a video about the same thing um, uh, that's, that's not very old either. Well, I do want to switch topics a little bit. Um, another thing that many people may know you from is your activism. 
many years of which I would summarize by saying that you have been very active around issues of preserving the integrity of organic certification. And we certainly need that because there are a lot of interests that would like to water down the integrity of organic certification. For example, I know you spoke at the United Nations in 2014 about organic farming, and you're also one of the agrarian elders who met in 2014 to assess the state of organic farming. And also, you were the founder and president of the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association, which people may know by the acronym OSGATA, O-S-G-A-T-A, which is a national nonprofit membership organization committed to protecting, promoting, and developing the organic seed trade and its growers, thereby assuring that the organic community has access to excellent quality organic seed, free of genetic contaminants, and adapted to the diverse needs of local organic agriculture. I know in 2011, Osgata filed a lawsuit against Monsanto, challenging the validity of Monsanto's transgenic GMO patents and seeking court protection for innocent family farmers who may have become contaminated by Monsanto seed. If I'm not wrong, and tell me here, that case basically turned on the fact that growers who did not want to grow genetically modified crops could find their crops contaminated by pollen from genetically modified crops, and if that weren't bad enough, those growers could end up being sued by Monsanto for having Monsanto's genetic material when it was really Monsanto who had harmed the growers by contaminating their crops. Which can be serious business since, rightly so, genetic modification is not permissible in organics, and if someone were growing, say, seed corn, which can be wind-pollinated from very far away, that contamination could prevent their corn seed from being saleable as organic. So. Can you tell us, uh, did I get anything wrong or tell us a little bit about the lawsuit and how that whole process ended up? Yeah, the, the one clarification I'd offer is that Oscata was the lead plaintiff, but the fact is we had about 80 plaintiffs in that uh, lawsuit representing uh, about 300,000 people uh, within the organic community. So um the other plaintiffs had as much at risk as we did, and and I was president of Oscata during those years. We filed uh, that lawsuit in uh, March of 2011, and if anyone is interested in in uh, the history of it, on our website, I think under resources, uh, we've got all of the um, uh, the history of that lawsuit and all the press releases we put out. Uh, it went on for uh, two and a half years, but. Um, we were represented by uh, the Public Patent Foundation, and what we were seeking was uh, two two actions. One was to gain court protection for uh, organic farmers that should we become contaminated by Monsanto's patented transgenic seed, that the court would protect us from being sub subject to a uh, patent infringement lawsuit by Monsanto. Under U.S. patent law, it doesn't even matter if you possess another's patented material without having signed a licensing agreement. Even if you don't know that you possess it, you were in violation and you were uh, subject to uh, patent infringement litigation. And Monsanto likes to bully farmers to get its way. And uh, many of the farmers that it has accused of um, uh, violating their patent rights simply settle out of court because they know that if they go up against Monsanto, they'll lose their farm. So they may have to pay eighty or a hundred thousand uh, dollars, but that's better than losing your entire farm. And then, of course, Monsanto has a gag order on the agreement, so the farmer can't can't uh, go public with uh, the the situation. So uh, one, we wanted farmer protection, and then we were also going to argue that the U.S. Patent and Trade Office had. Uh, improperly, unconstitutionally um, uh, granted these patents to genetically engineered crops because under um, well-established um, jurisprudence in the United States that was um, uh, articulated by uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Story, I think in 1820, that if you took a poison to the patent office, and wanted to get that patented, it would not qualify because it does not meet the public utility provisions of 
patent law, unless it provides a public good, it can't be patented. And our argument, and I think we had a strong argument, was going to be that genetically engineered crops are not a public good. They do not deserve to be patented. They do not to deserve to have that protection granted them. So um, as with every lawsuit, uh, Monsanto was challenging us on standing. Did we have the standing or the right to sue them? And, you know, that's what every big corporation does. They try to keep you out of the legal system because what they don't want, one, they don't want the discovery process. And we had, you know, the history of the tobacco industry to where the tobacco industry knew for decades the harm that tobacco caused their customers. And they, it was only in the discovery process of the tobacco lawsuits that, that these internal memos came out, which was smoking gun evidence that the tobacco companies knew about the harm that tobacco caused. We felt there was a parallel situation. Uh, it's now come out, you know, in the fullness of time with the uh, Roundup Ready lawsuits out West in California and elsewhere. Uh, the internal memos that have come out through the discovery process, it is now abundantly clear that Monsanto knew that these, that their Roundup was uh, causing uh, uh, physical harm um, to the the users of that technology, be they farmers or landscapers. So uh, we we felt confident that uh, Monsanto and all of their genetically engineered crops, uh, the the vast majority of them are Roundup Ready or uh, HT herbicide tolerant crops. Glyphosate is a uh, disaster. It's a you know the the GE technology is a um, a flawed technology that can only fail because from the get-go, uh, it was not valid. So we thought we had a strong case. So Monsanto uh, pursued uh, the line of argument that we didn't have standing. We lost the first um, uh, ruling at the federal district court in Washington to a Clinton-appointed federal judge that was uh, amazing. And if you want to... Uh, find out the quality of judges that we have. There is a review for everything online and there is a review of federal judges. So anyone interested can go to the site called The Robing Room, R-O-B-I-G, a robing room and look up uh, Judge Naomi Buckwald, B-U-C-H-W-A-L-D. And the listings there have lawyers that practice in her courtroom and, and the what they're explaining, the same experience they have, you know, giving uh, the uh, prosecution or defense tips on how to win this lawsuit. It was uh, uh, quite a thing. Anyway, she ruled against us. I think she had her mind made up uh, before uh, we ever got to the trial. So we immediately appealed to the uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, A year later, went to the Court of Appeals and throughout the whole process, Uh, Monsanto was saying, listen, we're a good company. We don't go after farmers. And we knew that was a lie. And they said, we would not go after farmers who, you know, uh, through no fault of their own, uh, had contamination. Well, the Court of Appeals, which didn't understand agriculture, but they were trying. So there were three uh, judges on that. They issued a three to zero opinion. They issued an estoppel, a judicial order that forced Monsanto to make good on its claims in in court and, and in filings back and forth that basically said, okay, we're going to hold you to that. You're saying that you won't uh, sue farmers. We're going to hold you to that. Uh, so it was a partial victory. Uh, we didn't feel that we got what we, you know, everything we wanted by any means. So we appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court and, uh, they only take 50 or 60 cases a year, and there are about 5,000 that are offered uh, offered up. So you've got like a 1% chance of, uh, of having them look at your case. So they passed over our case feeling that uh, adequate justice had been meted out. But within this lawsuit, we had Canadians in our plaintiff group. And the reason is, if you sell into the United States, you are bound under U.S. patent law. So these Canadian farmers are every bit as much at risk. So that ruling from the Court of Appeals 
offered zero protection for Canadians. You know, they're in a different country, so a, a U.S. ruling can't have any impact. But it denied us the opportunity to argue our overall case that genetically engineered crops are not, should never have been patented. Uh, and, you know, we were denied that process. And uh, so we had to be satisfied with a partial victory. The one thing is that... Uh, the way typically a lawsuit like this would go, uh, it would be members of the plaintiff group that would be protected in any positive outcome for the out uh, for the um, lawsuit. But in this case, because uh, of the estoppel, it applies to every uh, farmer on U.S. soil in the United States. So in that way, it was broader, but um, it still was lacking in clarity because these judges don't understand uh agriculture, it, it allowed them, it allows farmers to, to hold on to that, but it doesn't specifically say that we have a right to plant them. It says we have, have a right to hold them. Well, farmers plant their crop, seed farmers plant their crop, hold back some of it to plant the next year. And there's no clarity because the justices aren't farmers. And, and you know, they thought that they had solved this and that because of that granting of uh, the estoppel, that that mooted the case that that we had no standing because they had given us the protection that we sought. But that was, you know, a, a partial uh, goal that we had, but it wasn't the whole thing. Which is unfortunate because my understanding is it has had a chilling effect on a lot of growers who, whether may have even just not been selling seed, but saving their own seed, stopped doing so for fear that they would get sued by Monsanto. You know, it's like they don't even want to get get into it because they know Monsanto is going to have more lawyers um, than they would. In fact, that's what the documentary about uh, the farmer up in Canada, Percy Schmeiser, I forget what the, the documentary was called, but that's this, this is the same issue as that whole, if people are interested in this, they could go find, do you, I don't Do you remember what the documentary is called or they could look up Percy Schmeiser? Yeah. Was, I, I, yeah. A, a, I'm sure they'd find that. Yeah. This, in Percy's case, he actually was saving back the seed and was, as I understand it, was spraying the crop with glyphosate. So he was trying to benefit from that technology. The difference in our case, uh, all of the plaintiffs uh, were not customers of Monsanto. We wanted nothing to do with right. Monsanto, and we wanted to be left alone and not be subject to a patent infringement lawsuit. So it, you know, it was two different things. The Supreme Court, again, uh, 11 people that don't understand agriculture, uh, they thought that a, a Bowman a Bowman v. Monsanto, uh, which they had ruled on the year before, and Mr. Bowman, I talked to him on the phone a couple of times. Uh, he was a older farmer in, I think, Indiana, and uh, he would go to the feed mill and buy feed-grade soybeans, and he'd plant them after he took off, I think, a winter wheat crop. And, uh, you know, planting in early July in uh, Indiana is a little bit risky whether you're going to get a crop. And he didn't feel like he wanted to pay for the, uh, the high price seed for a crop that might not mature. So, um, basically, you know, so he's buying feed. I mean, anybody can go to the feed mill and buy feed. And rather than feed them to pigs, he decided he's going to plant them. And the Supreme Court made a, an incredibly stupid decision saying that he, he can buy them, but he can't plant them. Well, he bought him. It's his own, you know. So you do have a problem of the judicial system not understanding how agriculture works. Yet, you know, they think they're smarter than farmers, so they can figure this out. And and anyway, uh, so we we were actually, I think, prejudiced a little bit because they had ruled against Bowman uh, a, a year previous, and they they didn't understand that there was a difference. You know, in Mr. Bowman's case, he was trying to use that. Um, Roundup Ready technology to benefit his cropping. We wanted nothing to do with it. We're certainly not customers of Monsanto, nor do we want to be. We just want to be left alone. We don't want our crops contaminated. Right. We don't want to be sued. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate you, you know, bringing that lawsuit on behalf of us. And like you said, all, all the organic growers out there, um, unfortunately, with something like one percent of the population farming now, unfortunately, I think most most judges and most people do not have a good understanding of agriculture, um, which makes it all the more important.
Well, and, and it gets worse. It gets worse than that. It's just we have basically corporate control of the economy, corporate control of the society, corporate control of the government. So, you know, in hindsight, we, you know, it, it was worth a try, but we were probably pretty naive to think that we could possibly beat a military industrial complex player like Monsanto. Uh, you know, they supplied Agent Orange in Vietnam. But you got to try. And ultimately, what we need is a safe and secure organic community. And that means that we've got to be, we've got to produce the seed that we need within our own community. And we can't be using, you know, varieties that are controlled by Monsanto. They hate our guts. The USDA hates our guts. We, to protect ourselves, we, we've got to develop that seed internally and we've got to prevent contamination from coming in from outside sources like the, the uh, genetically engineered industry. So without that, you know, you may have, if you can't start with clean organic seed, you're, you're not going to have anything that consumers are going to want to buy, right? So to me, you know, you got to start at the at the source. You got to protect organic seeds. So that was something, you know, uh, this this save group that we had uh, forty years ago. We had Pat Roy Mooney from Ontario come down, and he he explained it was the first time any of us had ever heard of this concept of genetic engineering, and uh, uh, the, he he's from the ETC group. Um, and and he was he was filling us in. And he said, "Guys, you you really have a problem that is coming." Up. This is in the mid 1980s. This is 40 years ago. And those of us who were raising organic seed, we understood that the 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 risk of contamination of this pollen going off site and contaminating it 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 was um, an, an existential threat uh, to production and to really having any clean seed supply. So, you know, this has been a, on our radar for a long time and the government has just been in bed with corporations like Monsanto opening every door that they want, donating, you know, making big campaign contributions to both Democrats and Republicans. And it's become a travesty and the regulators are in a revolving door relationship with the chemical companies and the biotech companies and their friends are passing the regulatory structure and, you know, it's a mess and the public is not being served. The public is being sold out by the corporate interests that find that it's a good, you spend a dollar here and you get back a hundred dollar or a thousand dollars worth of benefit. And, you know, uh, there's a good reason that people are unhappy with the kind of the dysfunction that we see in within the USDA national organic program. Um, you know, their lack of enforcement of the federal law that, that we passed in 1990 has led to untold difficulties. Uh, the entry of fraudulent corporations that are not growing organically, but are using the organic label and the scale reality that you can't, you know, you can't compete with a, a mega operation that has all the advantages of economy and scale and aren't growing organically, but get to call their stuff organic to try to compete against that as an honest family farmer. It's not working. So my, my interest in, in trying to defend organic seed was, was really predated by my interest in trying to protect the, the concept of organic in the marketplace. And I served in Maine. Uh, most of us are certified by MOFCA, the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardeners Association. So I served as a volunteer on the certification committee for almost 25 years. Uh, made, you know, ma made a lot of trips over the years down to central Maine. Uh, we met at Johnny's when Rob was president, Rob Johnston of, of Johnny's for many years. He was the, pre the, um, chair of that uh, committee and we'd review applications and write the standards and, and that whole thing. So I gained some expertise and I figured that the right thing to do was to use that expertise that I had to try to protect organic. But, um, back, back in those days, we were part in the mid eighties. Uh, our farm was certified not only by MOFCA, but by, um, uh, an OCIA chapter organic crop improvement association. So back in the mid eighties, 
half of all certified organic farmers were certified by uh, certifying agencies that were part of the OCIA Confederation. And what we were trying to develop was, you know, there, there was talk of USDA taking over regulation of the organic community. And what we were attempting to do was to create a farmer's guild that would be akin to the American Bar Association for Lawyers, the American Medical Association for Doctors, to where we would control this as a professional association of organic farmers, come up with our own standards, uh, come up with a bulletproof uh, system of certification that would, in the private industry, provide uh, assurance to consumers and to head off any, you know, takeover by USDA. But uh, what we came to find out is that uh, society holds doctors and lawyers on one level and they don't hold farmers on the same level. So USDA came in and then when it was obvious that USDA was going to take over regulation of the organic industry, we were faced with the option of either uh, turning our backs on it and having no input or trying to work and force USDA to do the best possible job. So the former option was not really an option at all because the USDA was not uh, keen on organic. And uh, we figured uh, that they would create a, a set of standards that were so bogus that anybody could get certified, the market would be flooded, the price would drop, and all of us could not make a living at it. So we got involved and we ended up um, passing a remarkably good law, not a perfect law. There is no such thing as perfect laws, but we passed, we got it tagged onto the uh, Farm Bill of 1990 and miraculously uh, it passed as part as a rider on that Farm Bill. And uh, so then it took uh, 11 or 12 years for USDA to um, implement it uh, coming through different different drafts of, you know, what the uh, regulations would look like. And then uh, eventually after a lot of fights going on, it, it took effect in October of 2002. So that's 20, 21, 22 years ago. Uh, and we do have this problem, which, you know, many of us were predicting at the time that USDA is not the kind of outfit uh, that you want running your industry. Um, USDA like other agencies like the EPA and the FDA, it's under corporate capture. So it is operating at the behest of the corporations that call the shot. So that's why you have illegal, fraudulent hydroponics being certified as organic. That's why you have illegal, fraudulent factory farms producing uh, milk from cows that never see the daylight, chickens that never get outside, bringing in fraudulent grain from Ukraine or Turkey, being fed to corporate farms in the Midwest. You know, it's a system out of control. If the USDA were doing an honest job of enforcing it, uh, there would be a demand for honest product. There, let me put that a different way. There is a demand for honest, authentic, organic food. And what is now becoming available in the marketplace is bogus, fraudulent, illegal food in that it is not um, in consonance with that Organic uh, Foods Production Act of, of 1990. But uh, it's a pretty tough deal where you've got uh, a federal agency that is acting in an illegal manner. It's a pretty tough uh, deal to try to get that corrected. Absolutely. Well, I, I, do, I do seem to remember that back when... Um when people were talking about making the organic standards a federal program, right? Because there were organic organizations like MOFCA, for example, here in Maine, that predate the national organic program, right? I do seem to remember there was a bit of a schism, uh, if you want to call it that, when the federal government was going to take over organic certification with some people um, some people saying that their own, let's say, state organization had higher standards, you know, uh, and I know, I think some people decided to just not be certified organic anymore. And then some people wanted to, you know, be a part of the process. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I do think you're right that the USDA is, you know, watering standards down to make them 
more acceptable or easier for for the big companies, whether it be livestock standards or allowing hydroponics for or, organic certification and those kinds of things. Yeah, unfortunately, we are seeing uh, some erosion of the organic standards. And actually, that's that's another thing that I wanted to ask you about the hydroponics in organics. I'll say the issue is a self-created problem that we only have here in the United States because the rest of the world does not allow hydroponic production to be certified organic. We're unfortunately the outliers on that. But um, I found a statement from Osgata saying it supports opposition to hydroponics in certified organic production. It is absolutely clear that organic production traditionally has been and must be soil based. Um, and that Oscata urges resistance to the concept of hydroponics in certified organic production. And I know there have been some setbacks since hydroponic production is currently certifiable as organic, once again, only here in the United States, but I am glad that there are people like yourself in the Real Organic Project who are continuing to fight against that and trying to keep the soil in organics. Can you tell us a bit about your opposition to hydroponics in organics? Uh, your involvement and where the fight stands at this point on that? Well, um, the USDA is trying to rewrite history. Uh, uh, I, I, I read a recent um, explanation. Somebody, some top official at USDA said that this has been really settled law for 20 years, which is total fabrication. It simply is not true. In the... Um, it, in the National Organic Program NOP standards, which are um, authorized and required by the, the OFPA of 1990, it is a requirement. And, and backing up, when there's a requirement, you can't pick and choose what, what requirements you're going to follow. You've got to follow all of them. And there is a requirement in there that says you are required to maintain or improve the fertility of the soil. If you don't have soil and hydroponic operations do not have soil, they simply cannot meet that requirement. If you can't meet one requirement, it means you don't get certified. So all of that hydroponic production is fraudulent, it's illegal, and the USDA is facilitating this ongoing fraud of American consumers. They're doing the same thing with factory farms, livestock farms, uh, cattle production, um, hen production, either broiler or egg production uh, of these animals that are not getting outside access. It, you know, uh, so it, it's a tough deal. This has gone on under both uh, Republican and Democrat administrations. Um, you've got the lobbyists, the corporate lobbyist Organic Trade Association, which loves to talk as though it represents all aspects of the organic industry, including farmers, when in fact they represent the biggest corporate players. Many of them only have a small portion of their total sales organic, that basically 90% of what they sell is conventional and 10% is organic, yet they're on the board of directors of the OTA. And they're cheerleading along, you know, and, and in Washington, inside the Beltway, they listen to the OTA, you know, they swallow hook, line, and sinker that they represent uh, the entire industry, and they don't. Uh, they represent the biggest corporate players, and what do they want? This is an age-old situation for farmers. They want cheap input costs so that they can produce processed goods that they can sell to consumers. So they're never going to be the friend of the farmer. And they get their way, and OTA is their pit bull. Um, and, you know, they, they have a massive amount of uh, money that's going. And, and here's the other thing is there's a lot of USDA money that's going to these different NGOs, some of them are organic certifiers, others are NGOs that are, you know, working to better the situation of organic. But if you're reliant upon USDA money for your existence, are you really going to bite the hand that feeds you? So I think that money ends up become, becoming kind of hush money to just, you know, well, you can fight, just don't fight that hard, you know, continue your 
losing tradition here and, and we'll be happy. And, and OTA itself, they get funding from USDA that then they dish out to their friends in the NGO community. So it's, um, it's a very difficult situation. And like a lot of the ills of society, you see this uh, government money and corporate money basically buying acquiescence by people that should be allied to organic consumers and organic farmers, but they're actually, you know, not working in, in our best interest. Yeah. Well, unfortunately I, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, soil, Around the world, soil has always been part of organics, and I think, I just think it's not what people think they're getting. You know, the people who go out to the store and are buying organic produce, I don't think they think that it's coming from hydroponics. Um, and in particular, thinking about our readership and our listenership, I think it's really bad for for family farms because, like you were saying, I I think I think there's a lot of lobbying that goes on to. Uh, you know, weaken the livestock standards in 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 regards to hydroponics. To it took a lot of lobbying to get that into the organic program here in the United States, unfortunately. And I think a lot of the reason is, like you said, because it can bring down costs, and it also means, well, as you know, that uh, to transition a piece of land that wasn't organic into organic production takes three years. And so, I think one of the things that it allows. Uh, big companies to do is to take a piece of land that isn't certified organic and then just grow in bags, you know, either, you know, cover over the land or just grow in bags on the land. They can be into organic production in, in, you know, a year instead of having to wait those pesky three years to actually, like you said, build soil, improve the land and and take care of the land and get it, get it organic. So unfortunately I do think it's, um, it's giving an advantage to you know, to big corporate industrial producers who aren't trying to take care of the land the way that all a lot of our listeners and, and readers want to you know take take better care of, of their their piece of land and 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 giving an advantage to the people who don't want to take care of the land. So it's bad all the way around. Um, I don't know what the uh, I know that, that that it's still still quite a fight, and I'm glad that um, the Real Organic Project is. And, and others are, are keeping it going because I think it's a, it's a travesty that they're allowing uh, organic production in, in uh, uh, hydroponics in organic production here in the United States. And so maybe one last thing I'd like to add on that subject is that I've always been an advocate of becoming uh, certified organic because I think if you're an organic grower that's not certified, you're kind of invisible. And that... Mm-hmm that you really, in my opinion, you've got an obligation that if you're part of the community, that you're building this massive uh, network of knowledge of how to produce organically, you also need to be contributing to the political push that um, is possible when farmers work together, uh, united in a cause. So, uh, you know, here in Maine, I, I don't know what the figures would be now, but I, I've heard it said that there are probably two to three times as many organic farmers in Maine as are certified. So I think we probably have, Mofka probably has 500 certified operations. There's probably more like a thousand or 1500 operations. And, you know, we're down to, we have 7,800 farms in Maine. If there are 1500, if they are, if they were certified, Then you go to the legislature in Augusta or on a national scale down to D.C., you know, you would be representing 15, 20, 25 percent of the farmers in Maine would be organic. You would have much more sway in in getting um, beneficial legislation passed that would be beneficial to organic consumers and beneficial to honest, authentic organic farmers who are doing the thing right. So I I would. encourage your listeners to consider becoming certified organic. And then now uh, the prerequisite for the real organic um, program, ROP certification, is that you have to be certified organic. So get your organic certification through the NOP program. And then as soon as you can get ROP certification on top, on top of that uh, to be able to be counted. And, and I think that's important. And I think it's more important now as, as, Things really are kind of falling apart as the corporate takeover is, is gaining momentum within within organic. But the thing to remember, I think there's something like 18,000 certified organic 
farms within the uh, NOP system. And it's something like 97 or 98 percent of those farms are family farms. You know, it's just a tiny minority of mega farms, and they're producing uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of sales. But in the case of hydroponics, in the case of factory farm livestock, it's fraudulent. It's not real organic. And I was speaking, uh, I, I attended seven uh, NOSB National Organic Standards Boards meetings in a row uh, back in, in my days at OCIA or uh, in my days at OSCADA. Uh, and I was talking to a top uh, USDA official at that time, and he was saying that if we decertified these uh, layer operations, 80% of the organic uh, chicken eggs would disappear from the market shelves. And I said, I got no problem with that. What that means, that's a, a market opportunity for a, a genuine grower that with maybe five, up to 2,500 birds, 5,000 birds for that grower to go in and supply authentic eggs. The consumers want authentic organic and this uh, fraudulent product that the corporations are giving us with uh, false labeling. That's not what consumers want. And eventually they're going to figure this out. And, and if we, sit on our hands and do nothing to try to correct it. I think that there's going to be hell to pay when consumers finally figure out that, oh, jeepers, have I been paying this premium and feeding this to my family? And it really, you know, the Washington Post did the, uh, they tested some of the organic milk from some of these uh, fraudulent operations and found that there's really no, very little difference, virtually no difference between this corporate organic milk and conventional milk, you know, but real milk produced on real organic farms following the real organic standards, that's bona fide. That's what consumers want. So I think, you know, back 40 years ago when we were trying to form this guild of organic farmers, we were smart enough to know that ultimately, if we can do a good job, we'll uh, protect the market. We have the expertise of production. There's no one better for than us to protect the interest of organic consumers and it's only intelligent service to provide, you know, protection to a concept like organic farming and USDA, which has never respected organic and, and operates at the behest of corporations that want to, you know, skip the rules because it costs too much to, to obey them. And it cuts down the, you know, the, we just have different interests. Organic farmers' interests and organic consumer interests, I think, are one and the same. And these corporations are the ones that need to be marginalized. Uh, but, you know, right now, uh, we're the guys that are being marginalized. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, th I think what we're seeing is I think I think uh, at the beginning of organics, it, we were laughed at, you know, the, the industrial agriculture just thought it was a, a fad or something. But then once once the market share of organics got big enough to make big companies take notice, it's like they thought, well, we want to get on, get in on it, but by watering the standards down. So like you said, I think it cuts down on the opportunities for people who want to do it right, permitting organizations to do it wrong in, in more cheaply. So um, unfortunately, I think that's the stage that we find ourselves in. But I'm glad that there are people like you in the Real Organic Project uh, working on it. Well, I think we, we've been talking for a good long time, but I just wanted to make ask, are there any other issues in the politics of organics or agriculture in general that you'd like to make sure to bring to our listeners' attention? Well, um, in our case, I, I think I was starting out to answer this question and, and drifted off in a different direction. But in our case, um, um, Megan and I, my wife Megan and I, started the farm up and uh, we've had four kids uh, and our second oldest Caleb is, has taken over the farm. So now Megan and I work for him and we've got another five employees that are neighbors that uh, work for us uh, uh, a little bit more in the winter, a little bit less in the summertime. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's all we can do to move 11 acres of potatoes, you know, one pound at a time or five pounds and, you know, 20 pounds here and there. Occasionally to market farmers, you know, 200 pounds, 300 pounds. But 
Uh, given the size of our farm, we find that, you know, the business is doing better when we're selling to home gardeners. So that's the direction that uh, uh, I'd say COVID helped us to open our eyes and saw that that, that was, uh, you know, uh, before COVID there, it was said that there are a hundred million gardeners in the country. And that includes people that have a lawn. And then with COVID, I think there was an additional 30 million people that came in in 2020. And, uh, uh, all of the organic seed industry went crazy beginning that Friday in mid March, March 13th through something. Our sales, all of the companies, our sales tripled overnight, uh, when the country went on lockdown. But, you know, growing your own food, uh, you know, having a gardening, a garden, you know, having the kids help you in the garden. Those are all, I'd say, some of the, the beneficial aspects of COVID. And, you know, I'd say that a lot of, you know, a lot of organic operations prior to COVID were languishing. You know, CSAs were losing membership. Uh, uh, farmers markets maybe had become overly saturated and were, you know, it was hard to get customers, hard to get, uh, you know, make it viable for vendors. So I, I think all of the, all of these issues come down to kind of the economics of, of family farming. And I think we, we, we need to do the best job that we can to try to be viable, uh, cause you do want another generation to take over. You know, we've worked hard for almost 50 years and, to me, it is rewarding to see that the efforts we put in are going to continue, you know, providing stability and good livelihood, you know, to the next generation coming along. And, and I think you, you just can't escape the frustration of, um, the USDA not doing its job of not enforcing regulations because you, you can't, you can't do a good job at farming and get paid uh, so little that you can't make the economics of it work. And I think that's what uh, family farmers, whether you're organic or not, I think that's what we're all facing. It's uh, USDA has had a cheap food policy that they won't admit to, but they put it into into place uh, beginning in the 1950s. So for 70 years, the federal government has been pushing down the cash register price of food, and then they use their subsidy system to provide subsidies to the largest operations so we're having to compete with that low cash register price and we're not the beneficiaries. 80% of those uh, federal subsidies go to the largest 10 or 20% of operations. So we're not getting that. We're just kind of getting rubbed uh, between uh, these opposing forces. But um, the bottom line is that, uh, that I think, you know, in a, in a democracy or a, a faulty democracy like we have, I think you got to be involved and, and I think that's been my, you know, life story is that I always felt I'm doing this. I've got some knowledge that other people won't have. So I need to use that knowledge and try to leverage it. Uh, and, you know, people in society, I think they want to hear from farmers and they benefit from hearing from farmers because I think we've got some some good ideas and some good solutions. And I think we've got, you know, millions of consumers on our side. So I think if we're going to win at this. We've got to have good leadership and we've got to join forces with the consumers that we're selling to. Because uh, as you were saying, 1% of the population farming, we've got no political power anymore. But if we join forces with the consumers that, that we're helping feed, uh, that would be a very powerful uh, force. And I think that would then create economic circumstances that are beneficial and are going to make family farmers uh, say, and I, I, I really think that, you know, we're, we're one of the important anchors of democracy and, and maybe the faltering that's going on is because farmers are not as present as, uh, you know, in, in influence as they should, but, you know, getting involved, doing what you can. And, and that's the rub. Farmers, you know, we all work way longer hours than, than anyone outside of agriculture would believe that we're capable of and that we would work for so little. <laughs> In terms of, you know, remuneration for what we're doing, they just wouldn't believe it. It's beyond their ability to, to comprehend. So that's why I enjoy going like Mofka every fall has a farmer to farmer conference where farmers get together. And for many of the farmers, we see them once a year and that's it. But to be able to interact with other farmers who are doing the same thing that you're doing, uh, and making it work, you know, those are bonds, um, uh, 
you know, our, our kids that are now taking over the farm have bonds with the kids of other farmers that they've known for, you know, 20 years since they were kids. So um, I think there is a community. I think the organic community is the best community, and I'm grateful to have been a part of it. And if you're a part of it, you only want to protect it and make it work. But, uh, you know, we can't give up uh, and become hopeless. It's not a hopeless situation. Um, the pendulum swings. Times are hard now, but we tend to look at things as being a straight line. But, you know, uh, Strauss and Howe in their book of uh, – talking about these cycles of history that uh, their study going back to the 1500s is that we go in basically generational cycles. The cycle is 80 years, four generations of 20 years, and that uh, usually the, the the best of times follow the worst of times at that 20-year segment. So I'm hoping that that the 9-11 uh, the terrorism uh, two decades, that, that was the war period that is followed by the good and the turning to light is what's up ahead. Uh, but I think we tend to look at things linear, like, well, it's, it's going bad. It's only going to get worse, but that's not the lesson of history, according to historians. So, uh, it means to get ready, uh, do the best job you can, uh, unite with your allies, uh, to, to try to make it better for everybody. And when you make it better for everybody, you're going to make it better for yourself. That that's the beauty of the system. That's a nice hopeful note to end or close to end the interview on. Um, yeah, it is. It is discouraging to see. Um, yeah, Monsanto winning lawsuits, uh, hydroponics being permitted in organics and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, um, there are more farmers markets. You know, the number of farmers markets has grown a lot over the last 20 or 30 years. There there are more farms. I mean, some are going out of business and some are coming in. So I guess, yeah, that's it. Is if we would love it if we could have more farmers too. I mean, that's that's. I think the whole you know get big or get out philosophy of you know that whether Earl Butts is still around or not, you know that I think that that philosophy still lives at the USDA. And so you know that's one thing here at the magazine we would love to see just more more people come into farming. Uh, so hopefully. We can see more farmers and we can also, like you said, have the, the consumers realize uh, how they're not getting what they paid for uh, with the big corporate organic. And, you know, if we can unite those forces, we might really get some change. So we can we can uh, we can keep doing what we can do on those things and hope for the best. I know we've been talking for a pretty, pretty good piece of time here, and I, I really appreciate your time today, uh, Jim. Well, Jim, I, I have a lot of respect for what you've done for the, the, the farming community and the organic community over the years. Uh, let's do it again sometime. You know, I could definitely, I think you're, you're the kind of person we could definitely hear from more than once on the podcast. So I do, I do appreciate the time today. I did want to make sure and, and just ask, uh, where can people find you either online or social media or wherever you, you'd like people to, to look you up? Yeah, the easiest thing would be to find us online. Our website is www.woodprairie.com. Uh, and that's W O O D P R A I R I E dot com. Um, uh, we're easy to find. Uh, if you type in organic seed potatoes, uh, Google that, uh, we pop up pretty early on that. So that's another way to find us. But, um, you know, main organic seed potatoes, it's pr we're pretty easy to find. All right. Well, I've really enjoyed it, Jim. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to talk to us, and I, I think our audience will too. So thanks again, and uh, take care. Hopefully we'll see you again uh, on the pod one of these Okay, days. Andrew, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm happy to do this anytime. <laughs>